God is the God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some glory days, then welcome to the study of the book and life of Joshua. God gave him and the children of Israel a second shot at the promised land. They took it, and they were never the same again. And if you're interested in taking a shot at the promised land, you'll love this story. You were given an outline as you came in. This is section number two, our lesson number two. We began last week. We'll continue through the end of June, a study of glory days. Let's pray together, and then we'll get to work. We thank you, Lord, for calling us together today. We ask that you'd please have mercy upon the speaker. His sins are many. Grant us to see Jesus. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The time has come to attack the disease. It has raged untouched too long. It has infected unhindered too many. Misery bobs in its wake, abandoned dreams, ravaged marriages, and truncated hopes. Hasn't the malady contaminated enough lives? It's time to declare war on the pestilence that goes by the name, I can't. It attacks our careers. I can't keep a job. Self-control, I can't resist the bottle. Our marriages, I can't forgive. Our faith, I can't believe that God cares for me. I can't. The phrase loiters at the corner of discouragement and despair. Had Joshua mumbled the phrase, who would have doubted him? Let's take a minute and look at Joshua's difficulties. Beginning in chapter 1, in verse 1 of this Old Testament book, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. We're only words into the book and already someone dies. The story of Joshua begins with a funeral. The funeral of Moses. Not just anyone, Moses. Moses was everybody to the Hebrew people. When the people were enslaved, Moses was the one who confronted Pharaoh when the Red Sea raged. Moses was the one who prayed for help. When the slaves were hungry or thirsty or confused, Moses was the one who prayed and, and God responded. God answered his prayers. Moses was Mandela to the Hebrew people. So to lose Moses was to lose the cause Imagine the dismay, imagine the fear, imagine the grief. But the grass had yet to grow over Moses' grave, and God told Joshua, Moses is dead, now therefore what? Arise. We would have expected him to say, Moses is dead, now therefore grieve, retreat, reorganize, find a therapist. <laughs> Instead, he says, now therefore arise. And already just one verse into the book, and we're getting hints as to a major theme in the book of Joshua, and that is God's strength is the strength that matters. Moses may be dead, but God is alive. The leader may be gone, but the leader is present. Even so, Joshua could have said, I can't, I can't do this. He had several reasons not to. In fact, he had about two million reasons not to. When you look at the census recorded in the book of Numbers, chapter 26, an interesting detail surfaces. And that is, Joshua led into Canaan 601,738 men aged 20 and over. Assuming that two-thirds of those men each had one wife, and assuming that that man and wife had, I don't know, a couple of kids, the number of this population swells quickly to over two million people. Keep that in mind as you're reading through the book of Joshua. Joshua is not leading a Boy Scout troop through Canaan. 
This is a city the size of San Antonio or San Diego. Two million people, two million inexperienced people. They've never been to Canaan. They've been out in the wilderness. They've never seen a fortified city like Jericho or trained fighters like the fighters of Ai. Now, they can fight snakes. They can handle the desert. But do they have any response to the iron-wheeled chariots of the Canaanites? And speaking of the Canaanites, what about all these enemies? The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Jerichoites, the Cellulites. <laughs> Odd names to us, but these names struck fear in the hearts of the Hebrew people. You need to understand for 400 years, these people had a stronghold on this land. They were referred to as early as in the days of Abraham in the book of Genesis when God told then Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. But they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God foreseeing the evil hold that the Amorites would have on these, this land, that it would continue for 400 years. For 400 years, these people had contaminated this land that God had given to Abraham. Historians tell us that they sacrificed babies in worship that they practiced orgies, they dedicated themselves to witchcraft and idolatry. The Talmud, which is the ancient commentary on the Bible from the Jewish culture, called the Amorites an evil and sinful people whose wickedness surpasses that of any other, whose life will be cut short on earth. Yet another reason for Joshua to say, I can't do this. I can't. Moses is dead. I can't. I've got a bunch of inexperienced tenderfoots. Two million of them. I can't. Have you seen the people on the other side of the Jordan River? They eat folks like us for breakfast. <laughs> but Joshua never had a chance to declare defeat. He was still reeling from the death of Moses and then the invitation of God when God gave them this declaration, look at it. Arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which what? I am giving them. Underline that phrase. I am giving them. Not the land I might give them. Not the land you must conquer not the land of which you must prove worthy, not the land you must earn, confiscate, conquer, or purchase, but you must go to the land I am giving them. A transaction had already happened. God was giving them the land. The victory had already been won. The decision had already been made. So victory was certain because victory was God's. When I was 16 years old, something remotely similar happened to me. One night at the Locato dinner table, somewhere between the passing of the beans and the passing of the peas, a set of keys appeared on the table next to my plate. I looked at the keys, and the ensuing dialogue went something like this, Max. What are these keys? Dad. Keys to a Plymouth sedan that's parked out in the driveway in front of the house. Max. Whose car is it? Dad. Yours? Max. Are you serious? <laughs> Dad. Serious as a heart attack. Max. Gulp. <laughs> I had asked my dad for a car every single day of my life. <laughs> In my sonogram picture, <laughs> I am holding a sign that says, Car, 
please? Other babies, when they say their first word, say, Mama. I said, Mustang. (laughs) But my father's stock reply to my daily pleadings was, Max, you will have a car once you, and then fill in the blank. Earn it, buy it, save up for it, qualify for government subsidy. (laughs) He made it clear car acquisition was my job. But then came this wonderful, glorious event, this change of course in which he handed me the keys. In a moment of weakness, he didn't hand me payment vouchers. He didn't hand me car payment requirements. It turned out the company for which he worked, Exxon, called Humble in those days, was auctioning off a bunch of company cars, dirt cheap, and in a moment of weakness, he bought me one. (laughs) It was an old sedan, four-door company car, but hey, who's picky? I had a car. He handed it to me. I had a car because he decided to give it to me. Simple as that. The Hebrews had this land because God determined it would be theirs. Simple as that. About the time Joshua lifted his jaw off the ground, God gave him the specks of a land. He said, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I, there it is again, have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness of this, in this Lebanon, as far out as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, this shall be your territory. Now these were gypsies. They didn't own a sand lot. They didn't have anything. Yet in one grand divine fiat, they were given the land of their dreams, really the choice property on the planet. God handed Joshua the keys. And Joshua, in a great moment of faith, took the keys and said, I accept it. And I'm wondering if it is time for you to do the same. If you have given your heart to Christ, God has given Canaan to you. If you have given your heart to Christ, then God already has given you a promised land. The book of Ephesians, in many ways, is a New Testament version of the book of Joshua. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. What's the tense here? Past. This is past tense. He has blessed us. Not he will bless, might bless, someday could bless. There's no conditional language here. There's no secret, hidden possibility. This is a statement of something that has happened. The promised land property has been placed in your name. Canaan has already been given to you. A transaction has happened in the heavenly courtroom in which your name has been written at the bottom of the deed that says promised land. You already have access to every spiritual blessing that God can give. Stated another way, you already have everything you need to be everything God desires. You already, and I do too, have everything you need to be everything God desires. This very well may be the greatest secret of Christendom. We underestimate, I believe, what happened to us and what happens to others upon conversion. Most people when asked, what happened when you became a Christian, will say something like, well, my sins were washed away. 
I was forgiven. I was cleansed. And indeed you were. Cleansing happens upon conversion. But most people limit it to an cleansing, an act of forgiveness, a washing away of the past. As one man said, you go in an old clunker and you go through the car wash and you come out a clean clunker. (laughs) Most of us assume that conversion is simply a matter of cleansing of sin, which it is, but oh, there is so much more. You see, in God's plan, you go in a dirty clunker, but you come out a clean, sleek Maserati. He removes the old engine, caked and cracked and broken as it is with rebellion and evil. And he places within it a humming, roaring version of the Holy Spirit. He embeds within you. He embed. Don't look at me like I'm making this up. (laughs) He embedded within you the very presence of himself. He has blessed you with every spiritual benefit, every heavenly blessing. That's why the Apostle Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things, all things. Potential for a new attitude. Potential for a new self-control. Potential for a new faith. Potential for a new compassion. All things have become new. For Joshua, glory days began with a paradigm shift. Joshua 101 says, see life differently. You need a new paradigm. The old paradigm said, if I work hard enough, I can achieve the promised land. The new paradigm says, you have the promised land, now receive it. The old paradigm says, earn God's favor and he will bless me. The new paradigm says, I have God's favor. Now I'm going to learn to receive the blessings of God. The old paradigm said, if I save up enough money, I can get a Plymouth. The new paradigm said, hey, I got a Plymouth. I'm going to learn how to drive it. I'm going to take good care of it. Thanks, Dad. See the difference? One is in the wilderness. One is in Canaan. God wants to move us into Canaan. In Canaan, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. In Canaan, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. In the wilderness, you strive. In Canaan, you trust. In the wilderness, you seek God's attention. In Canaan, you have God's favor. In the wilderness, you seek to be saved. In Canaan, you know you are saved. You move from wanting to be to believing you already have. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything. God will equip you with all you need for doing his will. You see, when you were born into Christ, you were placed in Christ's royal family. As many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And since you're a part of the family, you have access to the family blessings, all of them. In him, we also have obtained an inheritance. The will has been executed. The courts have been satisfied and your spiritual account has been funded. You are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, he has also made you an what? An heir. Are you surprised? You ain't heard nothing yet. In another passage, the Apostle Paul says, the Spirit himself bears witness that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, look at this, heirs of God and joint heirs with Peter, Paul, Moses? No. We are joint heirs with Christ. Whatever Christ has access to, we have access to. Don't look at me like that. Whatever Christ has access to, we have access to. As the Apostle John said in 1 John 4, 17, our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. This means that God has placed on this planet right now people in whom he dwells. They are a chosen people, an empowered people. 
They have something that others do not. They have the living presence of Christ within them. They have access to power that others do not have. And if you have said yes to Christ, then Christ has handed the keys to Canaan to you. Astounding, isn't it? Which raises this question. How then do we explain the disconnect? How do we explain it? If we're coyers with Christ, why do we struggle so in life? If our inheritance is perfect peace, why do we feel like a perfect mess? We have access to the joy level of Jesus, yet we plod along like dyspeptic donkeys. God has given us the trust fund that makes Bill Gates look like a pauper, and yet we still worry, we still fret, we're still anxious. Why? I can think of a couple of reasons. One, we don't know about our inheritance. I have a hunch that vast numbers, thousands of Christians just don't know this. We don't know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. No one ever told us that we fight from victory, not for victory. Some Christians never live out of their inheritance because they just simply didn't know they had one. They thought wilderness was where we're supposed to be. There's a Native American fable about a brave who happened upon a nest of eagle eggs. Deciding to have some fun, he took one of the eagle eggs and he placed it in a nest with some prairie chickens. The eggs hatched and the changeling eagle believed himself to be a prairie chicken. So he spent his life clucking and cackling. And scurrying, he never tried to fly much more than a few feet off the ground. He thought he was destined to be a chicken. Then one day an eagle soared through the sky and something within him leapt. And he looked up and he said, oh, what a beautiful bird. What is that? And one of the chickens said, oh, that's an eagle. You can never be one of those. And he believed the chicken. And he went about his task of dirt scratching, bug eating, and clucking. When you read the story of Jesus Christ in the gospel, something within you leaps. He was never anxious. He always seemed to have wisdom. He was also compassionate. He respected the beauty of every person. There was just something about him. The most perfect person to ever live. Something inside you says, I want to be like him. But Satan has turned millions of demons loose on this planet like chickens. And they whisper to us, oh, you can never do that. You were born the wrong era. You come from the wrong generation. You don't have the right gender. You're not educated enough. Look at your past. So the eagle flies and we cluck, 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 cluck. But every so often, someone defies the voices of I can't. And here's the voice that says, with Christ I can. And they begin to soar. Because they realize that they have been given an inheritance. Moses, when he spoke to the children of Israel in the wilderness days, he had to remind them, God brought us out of Egypt so he could give us the land he had sworn to our ancestors. In other words, God brought you out of Egypt so he could take you in. He brought you out so he could take you in. They were happy for the wilderness. God says the same to us. I brought you out of sin so I could take you into power. I brought you out of fear so I could take you into courage. He didn't bring us out just to clean us up and leave us there. He brought us out to turn us from old clunkers into powerful forces. He needed to remind the children of Israel of this. I think we need the reminder as well. Maybe you didn't know this. 
Now you do. Which brings the second question. Will you trust it? Will you trust it? This is the second explanation for our weakness. We simply don't believe our inheritance. I had trouble believing my dad would give me a car. But you can bet your sweet September it wasn't long until I was putting that promise to test. Joshua believed. Will you believe? Will you begin to live like a child of inheritance? God told Joshua, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, implied in that statement is, I made this promise 40 years ago, and they didn't take me up on it. Glory days could have begun 40 years ago, but the people didn't believe me. Much to Joshua's credit, he believed. And he set about the task of inheriting the land. What about you? Do you believe that you are embedded with the very presence of God? Do you believe that you are embedded with the very presence of God? Do you believe that when you walk into a room, the presence of God is in that room? Do you believe that even though you can't forgive someone, God can, and since he can, you can? And even though you can't quit drinking, God can, and since he's in you, you can. And even though you can't control your temper, control your tongue, control your sexual urges, God can. And with his help, he can change you day by day. You have access to the spiritual power. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies is yours. And it's simply a matter of learning to drive the Plymouth. Learning to live in the new land. Learning to live with your new identity. You see, wilderness people and Canaan people have two different outlooks. Wilderness people say, I'm weak and I'll always be weak. Canaan people say, well, I was weak, but I'm getting stronger. Wilderness people say, I'm a victim of my environment. Promised land people say, I'm a victor in spite of my environment. Wilderness people say, no one in my family has ever amounted to much. I guess I won't either. God's people say, doesn't matter what my family did because I am now born into the family of God. We can only imagine what would happen if a generation of Christians lived out of their inheritance. What would happen if God's people really lived like God's people? Men would turn off internet porn. Lonely women would find comfort in God, not in the arms of strangers. Struggling marriages would spend more time in prayer, less time in anger. Children would consider it a blessing to care for their aging parents. A chicken coop full of Christian eagles would vacate the barnyard. Let's say I can't less. Let's begin saying I can more. God's power is very great for those of us who believe. That power is the same strength God used to raise Christ from the dead. I want to encourage you. Turn your I can'ts into I can's. With Christ, I can I can do all things through Christ because he gives me the strength. A new day awaits you, my friend. A new day of discovery, a new day of hope, a new day of power. You are no longer the person you used to be and you're just a fraction of the person you're going to be because by God's power, we're going to all learn what it's like to be children of the promise, inherit God's promised land. All right? Good days are ahead. Let's all be standing. Let's make this declaration. The words will appear on the screen. Fill your lungs with air, your hearts with hope, and say it like you mean it. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true, and his word is sure. With God as my helper... I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. 
These days are glory days. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We try our best, Lord. We have to have your help because even as we seek to be people of the promise, we fall back and become people of the curse. Today, Lord, though, we're stepping forward in faith, stepping into the promised land, asking you, Lord, to help us be the people you want us to be. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for your devotion to us. Through Jesus, we pray. And all the church said...